This is one of my most favorite quotes from The Power of Awareness. That which you feel yourself to be, you are. And you are given that which you are. So assume the feeling that would be yours were you already in possession of your wish. And your wish must be realized. So live in the feeling of being the one you want to be and that you shall be. Every feeling makes a subconscious impression. And unless it is counteracted by a more powerful feeling of an opposite nature, it must be expressed. Your feelings are different from your thoughts. Your feelings are what you experience in your body. The dominant of two feelings is the one expressed. I am healthy is a stronger feeling than I will be healthy. I am healthy says I feel healthy and I feel healthy. I feel great. I don't determine if I am well on the basis of what it says on a piece of paper or on the basis of what somebody else out there tells me. I live my life feeling within my body that I am strong, I am capable, I am able. And that is not just something that I say. It's not just an affirmation. An affirmation is an intellectual exercise. This is a spiritual knowing within that I am well, I am content, I am prosperous. But the words that Neville used there are the subconscious. Every feeling that you have makes a subconscious impression upon your body and upon your awareness. Now, you, you need to understand the subconscious mind of yours. Your subconscious mind rules your life. 96 to 97 percent of everything that you do is done as a result of your subconscious mind. And when your subconscious mind gets programmed, it goes ahead and responds to whatever it is your conscious mind has placed into it. I was 18 years old. I was in the United States Navy for four years. And they sent me to a school in Bainbridge, Maryland to become a radioman and a cryptographer. And we spent an hour a day, every day, for the first three or four weeks we were there on a typewriter learning Morse code, okay? And my conscious mind had to program my subconscious mind. Now this subconscious mind of yours is operating all the time. You're sitting here watching a, a, a television show. You got up, you picked up your remote control, you turned the channel on, you got dressed, you ate lunch, you went to the bathroom, you go to work, you get into your car, you drive to work, you, put, you don't think about what I'm gonna do. Everything that is going on in your life, everything, everybody in here in this room, you, know, you got here through your subconscious mind. You didn't have to think about every single thing that you were doing, but there was a time when you did in order to learn that. This habitual subconscious mind of yours rules your life. So I'm 18 years old, I'm taking Morse code. Dit, da, da, here's the alphabet, a little bit of it anyway. Da, 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 you're doing the same thing. Only you don't use Morse code, but you've programmed your subconscious mind with did it, it, da it, I can't do that. Did it, it, da it, that, I'm not very attractive. Did it, it, da it, that, I'm overweight. Did it, it, da da da, da did it, da, I can't do make things happen. And it's did it, it, da da da, da it's still there. 53 years later, you and you go through your life with the subconscious programming, with uh, with an awareness that. You are not in charge. You're not able to extend or transcend this, uh, this way of, of thinking. This subconscious mind of yours is most impacted by your feelings. A change of feeling 
is a change of destiny. A change of feeling is a change of destiny. <clears throat> Write it down. Stick it on the wall next to your bed. If you came into where I sleep, you would see that. I look at that all the time. I want to practice putting into my subconscious mind the assumption of the feeling of what it is that I would like to attract into my life as if it already existed and to feel it, not just to think it, but to feel it. Neville's Law of Assumption says this. If this assumption about what you would like to become is persisted in until it becomes your dominant feeling, the attainment of your ideal is absolutely inevitable. You must first assume the feeling of a wish fulfilled in all aspects of your life. So you have to say to yourself, what does it feel like to be prosperous? What does it feel like to, to be content? What does it feel like to, to be well? Living creatively is how I describe existing with a conscious awareness of the presence of this feminine principle. This mysterious female is always birthing, and the Tao Te Ching speaks of the gateway to her as the root of creation. It's telling us that we have the ability to tap into this unlimited field and co-create, or as I've said, live creatively through the Tao. The never-dying formative energy is both our heritage and our destiny functioning whether we're conscious of it or not. What awareness accomplishes through practicing the Tao is to let us participate in the process, which in turn leads us toward the wholeness that is our ultimate earthbound task. Although his writings are almost 3,000 years old, Lao Tzu is offering 21st century advice here with a message that's as timeless and never-ending as the Tao itself. Words may change, but be assured that the feminine energy can and will bring you to your own perfection. If you choose to be aware of the inherent creativity that resonates deep within you, where the invisible Tao sings the loudest, you'll assist the birthing of new ideas, new accomplishments, new projects, and new ways of understanding your life. In Deng Ming Dao's 365 Dao Daily Meditations, the divine feminine energy is equated with the sound of birds soaring and gliding over a vast landscape. Quote, You can feel this in your life. Events will take on a perfect momentum, a glorious cadence. You can feel it in your body. The energy will rise up in you in a thrilling crescendo, setting your very nerves aglow. You can feel it in your spirit. You will enter a state of such perfect grace that you will resound over the landscape of reality like an ephemeral bird song. When Tao comes to you in this way, ride it for all that you are worth. Don't interfere. Don't stop. Don't try to direct it. Let it flow and follow it as long as the song lasts. Follow. Just follow. End quote. Here are some thoughts for living creatively. First, know that you are a divine creation birthed not by your parents, but by the great spiritual divine mother, the Tao. When you're in touch with the energy of your origin, you offer the world your authentic intelligence and talents and behaviors. You're co-creating with the you that originated in the Tao and the very measure of your essence. The Tao is not confused about what to create and how to go about it, as this is your legacy from the mysterious feminine. Listen to your inner callings. Ignore how others might want to direct your life energies. And allow yourself to radiate outward what you feel so profoundly and deeply within yourself. There is a reservoir of talent, ability, and intelligence inside of you that's as endless and inexhaustible as the Tao itself. It must be that way because you are what you came from, and where you came from is this all-encompassing, endlessly creative Divine Mother, the mysterious feminine of the Tao. Whatever you feel within you as your calling, whatever makes you feel alive, know in your heart that this excitement is all the evidence you need to have your inner passion become reality. This is precisely how creation works, and it's that energy that harmonizes with the Tao. And secondly, be creative in your thoughts, in your feelings, and in all of your actions. Apply your own uniqueness to everything you undertake. Whatever you feel compelled to do, be it write music, design software, do floral arrangements, clean teeth, or drive a taxi, do it with your unique flair. Being creative means trusting your inner callings, ignoring criticism or judgment, and releasing resistance to your natural talents. Without fail, 
she reveals her presence. Without fail, she brings us to our own perfection. Then choose to let go of the doubt and fear you've harbored within you regarding your capacity to harmonize with the creative power, a power that's not only greater than your individual life, but is life itself. As the great 14th century Sufi poet Hafiz reminds all of us, quote, Just sit there right now. Don't do a thing. Just rest. For your separation from God, from love, is the hardest work in this world. Unquote. When you reconnect to your Divine Mother, you'll be living creatively. You will, in fact, be living the Tao. Do the Tao now. Today, notice babies and small children. Look for the mysterious feminine nature in little boys and girls who haven't yet become so attuned to cultural and societal demands that their true selves are hidden. Can you see some whose inherent nature is intact? Notice what seems to be their natural character or their gift from the Tao. Then try to recall yourself as a child when the natural Tao-given self was unaware of the ego self. The time before you believed that acquisitions or power were important, who were you? Who are you now? Yes, today, spend a few moments with a young child and contemplate his or her connection to the Tao and how it unfolds perfectly without any interference. It's this idea of uh, ignoring what the senses tell us, you know, because uh, we go through our days, we go through our life, and we, uh, um, we pay attention to what we, what we see and what we touch and what we feel and what we smell, and... Uh, and 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 that becomes our reality and we think that that's the only reality that there is if i can touch it if i can see it if i can grab a hold of it if i can smell it um then that makes it real and if i can't um then it then it's unreal and uh what this is really about is is, is understanding the power of our imagination so that when we put an i am i mean let's just say you've got uh uh, you know, you, you've got a cold or you've got a flu or something like that. And, and if you're saying, putting into your imagination, I am well, uh, I, uh, you know, I am perfect health, I am well. But uh, you watch your nose and it sneezes and, it, and it's running and you've got a fever and, you know, you're tired and all of that. Um, the, the concept of being able to say I am well and living from that place in your imagination, um, uh, it, it's like, it's so foreign to us because we're just so convinced that what our senses tell us is the only reality that there is. And what this is really all about is being able to live from the end and put it into your uh, imagination. And regardless of what your senses tell you, regardless of what it says on the Internet, regardless of what information is uh, people are sending to you, regardless of what it says on TV or articles that you read or whatever, whatever it is, whatever I am you would like to have, including I am prosperous, you know, I am abundant, you know. Um, uh, and you look at your bank book and you say, there's nothing in it, and, you know, and I've got bills and, and how can I go around saying I am prosperous when these are all the, but, um, it's, it's being able to place into your imagination that I am reali realizing that the words I am really are the name of God and to say, I am prosperous rather than I will be, because to say I will be prosperous or I will be healthy means to say that I am, I don't have that now, and I don't, you know, and it's something that maybe will come in the future. And until you can assume a feeling of something in your imagination and just live with it, regardless of what all of the other physical evidence says, because basically what we learn is that um, the physical world is just an illusion, that it's, it's what's in our imagination that is the real, uh, you know, the real truth. And uh, that's just such a hard one for all of us, including me. Um, it really is. Yeah, but I've been practicing it, uh, you know, and I've done it so many times in my life. Um, uh, you know, b being able to say, I, you know, like I, I always give the example of when I'm writing a book, I have, a, I have the jacket of the book uh, already made in advance, long before I ever write the first word. And I wrap it around another book, and I, it's right in my writing space. And every day, I, I, I already say that, that, that this is already complete, you know, because I'm looking at it. So all I have to do now is just allow it to all flow through me. And that's getting into that place of allowing and beginning to, to uh, forget about, you know, what the physical world is, what all of your past experience has told you, what, what your whole history has told you, letting go of all of that and, and, and to be able to say, you know, I am well, I am happy, I am content. You know, in the Bible, in the book of Joel, there's a wonderful line that says, let the weak man say, 
I am strong. And being able to say, you know, say it and, and feel it and know it, and then, uh, th- and then you begin to align with the universal force that brings it, brings it into, uh, into being. So, uh, it's, it's the power of, of our thoughts and the power of our imagination that, uh, I really want to have people begin to, uh, to see what they can do with it. There are two kinds of attention, according to Neville. Subjective attention and objective attention. Subjective attention is different from objective attention. You want to use subjective attention, not objective attention. Neville says there's an enormous difference between attention directed objectively and attention directed subjectively. And the capacity to change your future depends on the latter. Whatever you have placed into your imagination, you always go to your reality and call that which does not exist as if it did. I am, and you, I have a rule about it. It's don't complain and don't explain. You don't have to explain what you have placed into your imagination. It is totally yours. One of my great teachers in my life in my early doctoral years was Dr. Abraham Maslow. He said, become independent of the good opinion of other people. Trust yourself. Subjective attention. You and only you, capital Y-O-U, are the subject that impacts the burning desire in your imagination. You are living and feeling as if your future dreams are a present fact. There's nothing natural about living a life filled with stress and anxiety, having feelings of despair and depression, and needing pills to tranquilize yourself. Agitated thoughts that produce high blood pressure, a nervous stomach, persistent feelings of discomfort, an inability to relax or sleep, and frequent displays of displeasure and outrage are violating your natural state. Believe it or not, you have the power to create the naturally stress-free and tranquil life you desire. You can utilize this power to attract frustration or joy, anxiety or peace. When you're in harmony with the seven faces of intention, you can access and pull from the source of all in order to fulfill your intention of being stress-free and tranquil. So if it's natural to have feelings of well-being, why is it that we seem to experience so much unwellness and tension? The answer to this question provides you with the key that leads to the peaceful life you desire. Stress is a desire of the ego. We speak of stress as if it were present in the world as something that attacks us. We say things like, I'm having an anxiety attack, as if anxiety is a combatant. But the stress in your body is rarely the result of external forces or entities attacking you. It's the result of the weakened connecting link to intention caused by your belief that ego is who you are. You are peace and joy, but you've allowed your ego to dominate your life. The following lighthearted way to stop taking yourself so seriously is from a book by Rosamund and Benjamin Zander. He's the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra, titled The Art of Possibility. It illustrates in a delightful way how we allow ego to create many of the problems we encounter that we label stress and anxiety. It's called Rule Number Six. I'll share it with you. Two prime ministers are sitting in a room discussing affairs of state. Suddenly a man bursts in, apoplectic with fury, shouting and stamping and banging his fist on the desk. The resident prime minister admonishes him, Peter, he says, kindly remember rule number six. Whereupon Peter is instantly restored to complete calm, apologizes and withdraws. The politicians return to their conversation only to be interrupted yet again 20 minutes later by an hysterical woman gesticulating wildly, her hair flying. Again, the intruder is greeted with the words, Marie, please remember... Rule number six, complete calm descends once more, and she too withdraws with a bow and an apology. When the scene is repeated for a third time, the visiting prime minister addresses his colleague, my dear friend, he says, I've seen many things in my life, but never anything as remarkable as this. Would you be willing to share with me the secret of rule number six? (laughs) Very simply, replies the resident prime minister, rule number six is, don't take yourself so damn seriously. Ah, says his visitor, That's a fine rule. After a moment of pondering, he inquires, and what may I ask are the other rules? Oh, there aren't any. As you encounter stress, pressure, or anxiety in your life, remember rule number six. At the moment you realize you're thinking stressful thoughts. By noticing and discontinuing the inner dialogue that causes stress, you may be able to prevent its physical symptoms. What are the inner thoughts that produce stress? 
I'm more important than those around me. My expectations aren't being met. I shouldn't have to wait. I'm too important. I'm the customer here, and I demand attention. No one else has these pressures. All of these above, along with a potentially endless inventory of rule number six thoughts, are from the ego's bag of tricks. You aren't your work, your accomplishments, your possessions, your home, your family, your anything. You are an aspect of the power of intention, dressed in a physical human body, intended to experience and enjoy life on earth. This is the intention that you want to bring to the presence of stress. You must become conscious of the need to activate thought responses that match your intention. These new responses will become habitual and replace your old habit of responding in stress-producing ways. When you examine segments of stress-producing incidents, you always have a choice. Do I stay with thoughts that produce stress within me, or do I work to activate thoughts that make stress impossible? Here's another easy tool that will help you to replace the habit of choosing anxiety and stress. I call them five magic words. Here they are. I want to feel good. I want to feel good. Your intention here is to be tranquil and stress-free. When you feel good, you're connected to your intentions, regardless of what goes on around you or what others expect you to feel. Many events will transpire in which your conditioned response is to feel bad. Be aware of these outer incidents and say the five magic words, I want to feel good. In that precise moment, ask yourself if feeling bad is going to make the situation any better. You'll discover that the only thing that feeling bad accomplishes in response to outer situations is to plummet you into anxiety, despair, depression, and of course, stress. Instead, ask yourself in that moment what thought you can have that will make you feel good. When you discover that it's responding with kindness and love to the bad feeling, which is quite different from wallowing around in it, you'll begin experiencing a shift in your emotional state. Now you're in vibrational harmony with your source, since the power of intention knows only peace, kindness, and love. I assure you that your decision to feel good is a way of connecting to spirit. It isn't an indifferent response to events. By feeling good, you become an instrument of peace, and it's through this channel that you eradicate problems. By feeling bad, you stay in the energy field that creates resistance to positive change and experience a stressful, anxious state as a byproduct. The things you call problems will perpetually present themselves to you. They'll never go away. Resolve one, and another one will surface. You'll never get it done. I urge you to simply accept the fact that you'll never get it all done and begin to live more fully in the only moment that you have, which is now. The secret to removing the harmful effects of feeling stressed and under pressure is to be in the now. Announce out loud to yourself and all who are willing to listen to you, I'm an incomplete being. I'll always be incomplete because I can never get it done. Therefore, I choose to feel good while I'm in the moment, attracting into my life the manifestations of my desires. I am complete in my incompleteness. All resistance melts away when you can feel complete in your incompleteness. Authentic power comes from your soul, that magical place that is always within you. The examples of people who have large amounts of money but are purposeless in their soul are everywhere. Famous actors and actresses plagued by drug habits, committing suicide at what others thought of as the peak of their careers, divorce rates among the very wealthy skyrocketing along with painful courtroom squabbles over who gets what. When you're on purpose, doing what you know you are here for, and forgetting about what will come into your life in the way of money and wealth, then ironically, money and wealth arrive in your life in amounts sufficient to provide you with a life of prosperity. And this is real magic in action. I can say this because it has always worked for me. When I chased after money, I never had enough. When I got my life on purpose and focused on giving of myself and everything that arrived in my life, then I was prosperous. What follows are some guidelines that you can use as you start to befriend your own miracle-making potential. First, of course, is to disdain all disbelief. Send scarcity out of your mind and refuse to have those kinds of thoughts. When an old habitual scarcity thought begins to enter your consciousness, simply say, next. It will remind you that the old thought is now finished and you are entering a new prosperous thought process. Using next as a magic word will remind you to get on with the magic of believing rather than the anguish of doubt. Study the world of matter, of all material possessions, at the subatomic level. Begin to note that everything material is nothing more than empty space when viewed from a closer perspective. 
See the folly of making that material world your master. Just like your thoughts, the material world is limitless. It is without beginning and end, totally abundant and totally available to you if you know what your true purpose here is. Develop a trust in your intuitive inner voices. It has been said that those who are classified as lucky are essentially those who go with their hunches rather than what others have prescribed. If you feel a strong inner inclination to change jobs or to try a particular investment, then place more trust in that hunch. This is your divine guidance encouraging you to take a risk, to ignore the ways of the herd, to be the unique individual that you are. Learn to trust your intuition and allow your physical body to travel the path that you are feeling within. Work at replacing thoughts within you that reflect the scarcity consciousness. If you elect to constantly tell the world what is missing in your life and how you can never get ahead, it is because you are in possession of an inner space that believes strongly in lacks. You can replace negative inner slogans with new thoughts that include abundance, plenty, bountifulness, profit, ease, and the like. When you see these thoughts as the way your universe is and process your world in these ways, the words and concepts will be your way of presenting yourself. You will begin to act on the new thoughts, just like you previously acted on the old ones to create your life circumstances. Develop a conviction in your heart that prosperity truly belongs to you. To think about prosperity is a great beginning, but you must make those thoughts that you are entitled to prosperity into actual beliefs. Merely wishing for it is not enough, for nothing will truly be in your life until you reach a conviction within you that it belongs there. Trust in the divineness that you are, and that is the perfection of the universe. Remember, when you trust in yourself, you trust in the wisdom that created you. And obviously, when you doubt yourself, you question that same divine intelligence that brought you here. Surrender and relax about it, and you will know what to do. You no longer have to worry. Prosperity will indeed come to you, and you will be creating it in a magical way. Trust in the miracle that you are, then get on with your life in a purposeful way. Get rid of the polarity that you may have about money. You have perhaps either seen money as God's blessing or as the arch enemy of spirituality. Keep in mind that if your purpose involves providing things that require money for others and for yourself, and if you are uncompromised about your own commitment to your purpose, then money will show up in your life to assist you with your heroic mission. The denouncing of money is a trap. Instead, See it as that which is manifesting in your life to assist you with your purpose. Then stay on purpose and use that money and any other physical abundance that will begin showing up in your life in larger and larger amounts to fulfill your commitment to your purpose. If money is all that you covet and you want it for the purpose of gaining power over others, then you will never get enough because you never get enough of what you don't want. Your goal is in the invisible realm, that place where you do all of your living, Money and other symbols of prosperity arrive in your life to assist you on that path. If you miss the message, you may see lots of money come into your life and you will also experience it disappearing. Avoid the trap of expecting your prosperity to arrive in your life through the efforts of others. You create your own life of prosperity. No one has to change in order for you to experience your own prosperity. This is an inner game and you must leave behind your expectations of others. Take responsibility for your own feelings about prosperity, and you will eliminate any and all suffering that you experience in this context. Prosperity is something that I know can be achieved by anyone. If I can experience it coming from my scarce beginnings, then it is hard for me to imagine that anyone else cannot make it happen. Principle number one. Be independent of the good opinion of others. There are many well-meaning people in our lives who have ideas about what we should or shouldn't be doing. Relatives tend to be specialists in this area. If we let them guide us with advice that isn't congruent with our inner calling, we'll suffer the anguish, the slings and arrows, if you will, of an uninspired life. Each of us can feel what we're being called to be. When we pay attention, we can hear our own impatient voices coaxing us to pay attention and complete the assignments we brought with us from the world of spirit. But when we allow the opinions and dictates of others to determine what we're doing or what we're going to be, we lose sight of our objective to live an inspired life. We need to determine for ourselves exactly how much we've allowed others to decide issues such as what we do, where we live, with whom we live, and even how we're treated. We must know that absolutely no one 
else truly knows and feels what we're here to accomplish. So we must give ourselves permission to hear our inner guidance and ignore the pressure from others. Principle number two, be willing to accept the disapproval of others. Logically following the previous principle, this one notes that we're going to incur the disfavor of many people when we follow our inclinations to be in spirit and live the life we came here to live. This isn't a selfish or a cynical attitude. When we begin to follow our ultimate calling, there will be a lot of resistance. In fact, the purpose of the slings and arrows sent our way is to get us to change our mind and be reasonable, which translates to, do it my way. However, as we gain the strength to ignore the pressure to conform, resistance will diminish and ultimately change to respect. When we steadfastly refuse to think, act, and conform to the mandates of others, the pressure to do so loses its momentum. Principle number three, stay detached from outcomes. Inspiration doesn't come from completing tasks or meeting goals. In fact, that's the surest way to have it elude you. Returning to spirit, you see, is an experience of living fully in the present moment. Our purpose in life isn't to arrive at a destination where we find inspiration, just as the purpose of dancing isn't to end up at a particular spot on the dance floor. The purpose of dancing and of life is to enjoy every moment and every step, regardless of where we are, when the music stops. Yoga master Sri Swami Sivananda offered the only worthwhile goal I know of when he said that the goal of life is God-realization. Now here's a goal that I can live with. After all, this allows me to live in spirit every moment of my life while simultaneously thinking ahead to the next God-realized moment and the next. As the great Indian sage Ramana Maharshi once remarked, there is no goal to be reached. There is nothing to be attained. You are the self. You exist always. Now this to me is real inspiration. Principle number four. Know that we need nothing. No things to be inspired. We came into this world of boundaries from a formless energy field of spirit. We arrived here with no thing, no things. We'll make our exit with no things, nothing. And our purpose, God-realization, requires nothing, no things. We are all that we need to be inspired and living on purpose. And the things that continue to flow into our lives are just symbols of the unlimited abundance of our source. In other words, these things have no value in and of themselves because everything in the physical world is changing and will dissolve back to nothingness anyway. When we tune in to what we know rather than what we see, we immediately find that every thought of God is repeated throughout the universe. We can watch as some things enter our lives and others leave, all the while remaining in spirit, knowing that all of those things have nothing to do with our state of inspiration. We need nothing more to be inspired since we're connected to spirit already. The ancient Persian poet Omar Khayyam offered us these words, which summarize this principle that we don't need another thing to be inspired. It's all right here, right now. He said, Forget the day that has been cut off from thy existence. Disturb not thyself about tomorrow, which has not yet come. Rest not upon that which is no more. Live happily one instant, and throw not thy life to the winds. Principle number five. Don't die wondering. This principle is extremely important in working toward an inspired life because it motivates us to act. After all, we don't want to be full of regrets because we failed to heed our ultimate calling. Attempting to do something, even if it doesn't succeed, is inspiring because we don't tend to regret what we do, we regret what we didn't do. Even following a futile attempt, we're inspired because we know that we gave it a shot. It's it's wondering whether we should or shouldn't try something that leaves us feeling stressed and incomplete. Principle number six, remember that our desires won't arrive by our schedule. There's an ancient aphorism that goes, if you really want to make God laugh, tell God your plans. In essence, this means that all we desire will arrive in our life when and only when we're aligned vibrationally with the energy of our source. Our ego won't be consulted or get to determine the schedule. Creation reveals its secrets when it's good and ready. Our job is to take the focus off of the when and put it on being connected to our originating spirit. Our job is to stop challenging and demanding responses from God and instead be more like God. 
our job is to understand and accept that all of the things that show up in our life, which we often find contradictory or troublesome, are there because we've attracted them. And we need to have these obstacles in order to clear an opening for our true spirit purpose to emerge. We can let go, surrender, and remind ourselves that all is in divine order. We're much more successful when we allow inspiration to flow in on God's terms than when we're impatient and demanding. As always, our job in God realization is to become more like God. That means surrendering to the timetable that's always perfect, even when it seems to be full of errors. Keep these six principles handy and access them anytime you find yourself lacking inspiration. Remember, too, that we're called to this world of inspiration, which beckons us to let go and let God. Tonight, and every night for the rest of your life, I want you to take the last five minutes before you go off to sleep and realize that you are about to program your subconscious mind. All right? Your subconscious mind is most at home when you are unconscious, when you are asleep. If you spend the last five minutes of your day, which so many people do, reviewing all of the things that you don't like, and all the things that didn't work out and how terrible you feel and who abused you and who was mean to you and who said this and they did this and you're constantly doing this kind of thing with your mind then you are programming your subconscious mind that when you awaken because you're now about to marinate for the next eight hours in your subconscious mind and then when you awaken you will rejoin the universal subconscious mind, the mind of God, from which we all originate. We're all just individualized personal expressions of that one thing that we call the Tao, or God, or divine mind, or soul, or spirit. But the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. So you want to be real careful about how you program your subconscious mind. This is from the book of Job. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. Job 33, 15 and 16. When you are slumbering on your bed, he opens your ears and seals your instruction. What you place into your subconscious mind as you are about to go into this deep slumber is all dependent upon what you do the last three or four or five minutes before you go off to sleep. You want to place into your imagination whatever you have placed into the I am that that I spoke about earlier. I am well. I am content. I am peaceful. I am happy. I am prosperous. I am abundant. I am God. I am God. I am God. Because at the basic core, each and every one of us are just that. So it's like if you just close your eyes and just listen to this meditation. <clears throat> it's from the book Three Magic Words. Here's what I'd like you to say to yourself at night. I know that I am pure spirit, that I always have been, and that I always will be. There is inside me a place of confidence and quietness and security where all things are known and understood. This is the universal mind, God, of which I am a part and which responds to me as I ask of it. This universal mind knows the answer to all of my problems. And even now, the answers are speeding their way to me. I needn't struggle for them. I needn't worry or strive for them. When the time comes, the answers will be there. I give my problems to the great mind of God. I let go of them, confident that the correct answers will return to me when they are needed. Through the great law of attraction, everything in life that I need for my work and fulfillment will come to me. It is not necessary that I strain about this. Only believe. For in the strength of my belief, my faith will make it so. I see the hand of divine intelligence all about me, in the flower, the tree, the brook, the meadow. 
I know that the intelligence that created all these things is in me and around me and that I can call upon it for my slightest need. I know that my body is a manifestation of pure spirit and that spirit is perfect. Therefore, my body is perfect also. I enjoy life for each day brings a constant demonstration of the power and wonder of the universe and myself. I am confident. I am serene. I am sure. No matter what obstacle or undesirable circumstance crosses my path, I refuse to accept it, for it is nothing but illusion. There can be no obstacle or undesirable circumstance to the mind of God, which is in me, around me, and serves me now. This is the great lesson. Know this within you. When Herman Melville was writing Moby Dick, he wasn't writing about a man looking for a whale. He was writing about a, a man trying to find his higher self. He said these words, For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man lies one insular Tahiti full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all of the horrors of the half-lived life. In every moment of your life as you leave here today, you have this choice. You can either be a host to God or a hostage to your ego. It's your call. Thank you. God bless you. Namaste. Thank you. That there is an alignment that you have to make in your life. You see, there's, there's two parts to being human. There's this form that we find ourselves in that was all handled in that split second. Like all of these hairs that are falling out was all handled in that second. That has not, I, it's, like, it's like you get to this point in your life where you watch your form and you watch it on its way to closing parentheses. <laughs> and, and it's like you get in back of it or in front of it or underneath it or around it or somewhere and you sort of just watch it. And another wrinkle will appear and uh, another, some, another drooping will take place that you didn't want. <laughs> Wait, you are not your form. You're something other than your form. You have to be careful when you use this on your children. I use this on my uh, six-year-old daughter, Summer, <laughs> and she was smart-mouthing one day and uh, just talking a little bit uh, fast, like uh, six-year-olds are prone to do. And I said, Summer, you don't talk like that to your mother. She said, that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> she had been at my talk the night before. I said, what do you mean it wasn't you? She said, that was my mouth, and I'm not my mouth. So you have to be careful. But what happens is that you get to this point in your life where you literally are capable of getting outside of this form that you occupy and coming in contact with another dimension of yourself that you can't describe with words any more than you can describe the experience of water with formulas. You must know it and go within and honor it and get it and as you do that it it comes about from this surrendering process from this knowing and this realignment see if you align yourself first with the physical side and then primarily physical and secondarily the spiritual side then your physical world is directing if you will the spiritual part of your life. The, the thoughts, the images, the feelings, all of this part of you that is invisible come from this phys the physical side of you. What it takes in order to experience real magic is to realign and to align yourself first spiritually and allow your physiology then to flow from that. It's almost like you have to get outside of your body, watch it do what it has to do, allow it to go through whatever motions it has to go through, but align yourself first and foremost with 
this invisible part of you. Now, most people don't get this. They don't ever get in their life that this invisible part, this thing that you can call thought or consciousness or soul or whatever it is, is something that is real because it doesn't have boundaries and dimensions like the physical world, we, send, we sort of put it aside and give it a couple of hours on Sunday morning. And then when that's over, we charge out of the ch church lot and don't even let our neighbors in very often on our way home. But it really, what, what it takes is, is this, in, this realignment. It happened for me when my grandmother died in 1983, on April the 15th, when she was admitted to the hospital and they weighed her in her 95th year, and she knew that she was dying, and they weighed her and she weighed 133 pounds because it was one of the things that they, they had to do to fill out all of the forms. And what was interesting, then my grandmother died. And there was, there was this, this package, this container, if you will, it wasn't my grandmother. It was cold and, and getting stiff and blue. And it was, my grandmother was this beautiful soul who raised five children who was, a, and that's who she was. And she certainly wasn't this, this container. And when they weighed this container for the death certificate, it weighed 133 pounds. And there was such a, such a powerful metaphor in that that when life passes from your body as it will it won't weigh any less as a result so that whatever it is that constitutes your life is weightless you can't get a hold of your life and apply the same rules that you apply to the physicalness that houses your body you can't do that you have to know that your life is invisible. It weighs nothing. And yet, you can never escape it. That you are not a human being having a spiritual experience at all. But that you're a spiritual being. Having a human experience. And the quality of that human experience is totally and completely and irrevocably tied to how you use that invisible part of your humanity. And here are the seven faces of intention. The first face, the face of creativity. The first of the seven faces of intention is the creative expression of the power of intention that designed us, got us here, and created an environment that's compatible with our needs. The power of intention has to be creative or nothing would come into existence. It seems to me that this is an irrefutable truth about intention and spirit because its purpose is to bring life into existence in a suitable environment. Why do I conclude that the life-giving power of intention intends us here to have life and have it in increasing abundance? Because if the opposite were true, life as we know it couldn't come into form. The face of creativity intends you toward continued creativity to create and co-create anything that you direct your power of intention toward. Creative energy is a part of you. It originates in the life-giving spirit that intended you here in the first place. 2. The face of kindness. Any power that has as its inherent nature the need to create and convert energy into physical form must also be a kindly power. Again, I'm deducing this from the opposite. If the all-giving power of intention had at its core the desire to be unkind, malevolent, or hurtful, then creation itself would be impossible. The moment unkind energy became form, the life-giving spirit would be destroyed. But instead, the power of intention has a face of kindness. It is kind energy intending what it's creating to flourish and to grow, and to be happy and to be fulfilled. Our existence is proof to me of the kindness of intention. Choosing to be kind is a choice to have the power of intention active in your life. 3. The face of love. The third of the seven faces of intention is the face of love. That there's a life-giving nature inherent in the power of intention is an irrefutable conclusion. What would we name this quality that encourages, enhances, and supports all of life, if not love? 
It's the prime moving power of the universal spirit of intent. As Ralph Waldo Emerson put it, love is our highest word and the synonym for God. The energy field of intention is pure love resulting in a nurturing and totally cooperative environment. Judgment, anger, hate, fear, or prejudice won't thrive here. So were we able to actually see this field, we'd see creativity and kindness in an endless field of love. This face of intention that is an expression of love wishes only for us to flourish and grow and become all that we're capable of becoming. When we're not in harmony with the energy of love, we've moved away from intention and weakened our ability to activate intention through the expression of love. Pierre Tellyard of Chardin put it this way, quote, The conclusion is always the same. Love is the most powerful and still the most unknown energy of the world. Unquote. The fourth face of intention, the face of beauty. The fourth of my seven faces of intention is the face of beauty. What else could a creative, kind, and loving expression be other than beautiful? Why would the organizing intelligence of intention ever elect to manifest into form anything that's repugnant to itself? Obviously it wouldn't. So we can conclude that the nature of intention has an eternal interaction of love and beauty and add the expression of beauty to the face of a creative, kind, loving power of intention. In order to grasp the significance of beauty as one of the faces of intention, remember this. Beautiful thoughts build a beautiful soul. As you become receptive to seeing and feeling beauty around you, you're becoming attuned to the creative power of intention within everything in the natural world, including yourself. By choosing to see beauty in everything, even a person who was born into poverty and ignorance will be able to experience the power of intention. Five, the fifth face of intention is called expansion. The elemental nature of life is to increase and seek more and more expression. If we could sharply focus on the faces of intention, we'd be startled. I imagine that one of the faces we'd see is a continuously expanding expression of the power of intention. The nature of this creative spirit is always operating so as to expand. Spirit is a forming power. It has the principle of increase, meaning that life continues to expand toward more life. The power of intention is the power to expand and increase all aspects of your life. No exceptions. It's the nature of intention to be in a state of increased expression, so it's true for you as well. Six. The sixth face of intention is called unlimited abundance. This sixth face of intention is an expression of something that has no boundaries. It's everywhere at once and is endlessly abundant. It's not just huge, it never stops. This marvelous gift of abundance is what you were created from. Thus, you too share this in the expression of your life. You're actually fulfilling the law of abundance. These gifts are given freely and fully to you, just as the air, the sun, the water, and the atmosphere are provided in unlimited abundance for you. You were created from this very same unlimited abundance. The power of intention is everywhere. It is what allows everything to manifest, to increase, and to supply infinitely. Know that you're connected to this life force and that you share it with everyone and all that you perceive to be missing. Open to the expression of the face of unlimited abundance and you'll be co-creating your life as you'd like it to be. The seventh and final face of intention is called receptivity. This is how I imagine the seventh face, the receptive face of intention. It's simply receptive to all. No one and no thing is rejected by the receptive face of intention. It welcomes everyone and every living thing without judgment, never granting the power of intention to some and then withholding it from others. The receptive face of intention means to me that all of nature is waiting to be called into action. We only need to be willing to recognize and receive. Intention can't respond to you if you fail to recognize it. You must not only become receptive to having guidance available to you to manifest your human intentions, but you must be receptive to giving this energy back to the world. As I've said many times in speeches and earlier writings, your job is not to say how, it is to say yes. Yes, I'm willing. Yes, I know that the power of intention is universal. It is denied to no one. By being receptive, I'm in harmony with the power of intention of the universal creative force. This works in so many different ways. You'll see the right people magically appearing in your life, your body healing. And if it's something that you want, even becoming a better dancer or a card player or an athlete, the field of intention allows everything to emanate into form.